There are many ways to determine how good an engine is. If you look at jet engines, the first thing companies always seem to advertise is how efficient and reliable they are. If you look at rocket engines on the other hand, and SpaceX's Raptor more specifically, all you ever seem to hear about is thrust. Thrust, thrust, thrust. In fact, SpaceX is even willing to sacrifice a few seconds of specific impulse, in other words efficiency, in favor of increasing the thrust on the second version of Raptor. Why is this? Why does SpaceX care so much about the thrust of their engine when other industries seem more focused on things like efficiency and maintainability? To answer that question, we'll need to examine launch profiles, the atmosphere, and more importantly, gravity's effect on them. Finally, we'll end on some considerations specifically for reusable launch vehicles. So let's get started. For those of you who know anything about rockets, which I imagine if you're watching this video is, is most of you, unless of course this is your introduction to the space flight community, which if it is, welcome, we're glad to have you. Stay away from this guy. Anyway, most rockets don't just launch straight up. As the saying goes, space, to get to space go you go up. But to, to stay, stay in space, space you have to go sideways really, really fast. Of course, you don't want to only go sideways. After all, Earth has buildings and mountains and, well, an atmosphere. This is one of two major reasons why rockets launch vertically in the first place. They have to get out of the atmosphere before injecting themselves into their desired orbit. The other big reason for vertical launching is gravity. Even on a body with no atmosphere, you can't just immediately turn horizontal. You would pretty quickly start descending and crash back into the ground. This is because you have, of course, not accounted for the pull of gravity. To counteract gravity and escape the atmosphere, rockets do what is called a gravity turn. After liftoff, a rocket will start gradually pitching down a few degrees at a time until it is out of the atmosphere and going fast enough that by the time gravity can pull it down, it has already flown past the planet. This is the definition of an orbit. You can see the maneuver quite clearly here in this video of Starship's fourth flight by watching the angle of the vehicles in the bottom of the screen. Okay, so far this has been pretty basic, but now I want to pivot and start talking about the effect the gravity turn has on launch efficiency. As I pointed out before, getting into orbit is about horizontal velocity, so any energy spent fighting the atmosphere and gravity is not actually helping you get into orbit. The capability of a rocket is typically measured by how much it is able to change its velocity. This is usually called delta v. Gravity on Earth is about 9.8 meters per second squared. This means a rocket that is just hovering is having to expend 9.8 meters per second of delta V just to avoid falling back down. TWR stands for thrust to weight, and refers to the ratio between a vehicle's thrust and, you guessed it, weight. A vehicle with a TWR of 1 has engines that produce exactly as much weight in thrust as there is weight on the spacecraft. What this means is that if the engines are fired at full thrust, the vehicle will hover in a perfect equilibrium. The rule is that a vehicle with a higher TWR will accelerate faster. Let's now apply this to a rocket launch. If we have two vehicles, Vehicle A and Vehicle B. Vehicle A has a TWR of 1.5 while Vehicle B has a TWR of 2.0. If we were to launch both rockets directly upward, each second they would still be losing 9.8 meters a second of delta V to gravity. But in the case of Vehicle A, it would also be accelerating upward at 4.8 meters per second per second. Therefore, a rocket with a TWR of 1.5 spends 66% of its fuel fighting gravity, with only 33% being used to help get into orbit. If we look at rocket B on the other hand, it has a TWR of 2. This means it splits the gravity losses and acceleration evenly at 50% each. Hopefully you start to see the benefits of higher thrust engines. To prove the effects of a higher TWR, I'm going to be launching a pair of starships in KSP. The first uses the Raptor 2 engine, the current version we've been seeing on Starship's integrated flight test so far. The other will have the next generation Raptor 3 engine, which comes with a roughly 22% increase in thrust along with a slight decrease in weight. After we're finished, we'll pull up the telemetry and the orbits to compare the two flights. For the purposes of this demonstration, I will be completely depleting Super Heavy, so no boost back or reuse. The throttle will also permanently be set to 100%, so there will be no throttle down during max Q. This is because the differing thrust levels on the two engine versions would require different throttle profiles. 
which would introduce another variable, and I'm trying to keep the comparison as apples to apples as possible. The payload is also the same mass for both launches and will end once the fuel on board the ship is fully depleted. With all that out of the way, let's get launching. Alrighty, time for the fun part. Included in these charts is data from each of the launches. The first launch with the Raptor 2 engines is on the left, while the Raptor 3 launch is on the right. The first thing I want to note is the difference in acceleration. For the first launch, Super Heavy produced at its maximum about 4.4 Gs of acceleration, with the ship pulling about 4.3. Compare that to the second launch where the booster pulled 5.3 and the ship came in at about 5.2. This resulted in the second flight exhausting its fuel roughly 76 seconds sooner. So those were some fun numbers to look at, but now let's get into the point of the video and compare the delta V usage of both launches. Luckily, we have a graph that shows just that. This little orange curve represents the amount of wasted delta V, or more precisely, the amount of delta V lost to gravity. If you look at both curves, you can see how they are both quite steep during the first few seconds of flight, but quickly flatten out as the vehicles perform their gravity turns. Alright, so what we are really interested in is the total amount of lost delta V for each flight. If we take a look, for the first flight we wasted about 1,579 meters a second of delta V. For the second flight, that number was 1,465, saving about 8%. While I wish we could just stop here, to find the true difference between these two launches, we need to examine the orbit each spacecraft was deposited into. The first launch resulted in an orbit of 150 by 207 kilometers. The second was 168 by 724. These orbits are obviously quite different, so we're going to need to find a way to compare them. To accomplish that, we will need to find the specific orbital energy of each. After using this very spooky looking equation and some calculators, we can determine that the first orbit had a specific energy of negative 30.4 km squared per second squared, and the second had a negative 29.1 km squared per second squared. Okay, this unit is not very intuitive, so we can do a little more math to get the figures in megajoules per kilogram. Alright, so now the energies are negative 27.15 for the first and negative 26.02 for the second. They are negative because it's actually calculating the energy required to achieve escape velocity. So what it's saying is that for each kilogram of mass, the first launch would need about 27 megajoules to escape Earth, and the second would need roughly 26, about a 4% difference. Okay, so the improvement has shrunk. While that's true, there's still one more thing we need to do, and that is to determine the payload difference, because just like most things in spaceflight, the relationship is not linear. Now, I do want to caveat these numbers by emphasizing that all this data is from Kerbal Space Program. The launches were not flown optimally, and the payload and mass figures are just guesses because this is obviously data we do not have. So don't expect these numbers to be perfectly accurate. They are more of an approximation as meant to demonstrate the effect TWR has on launch efficiency. With all that out of the way, time for the results. If both spacecraft were launched into a similar low orbit, the Raptor 2 ship could deliver about 132 tons of payload, while the Raptor 3 version could deliver 153 tons, a 21 ton or about 16% improvement. It is important to note that because Starship's dry mass is relatively high, the payload difference will shrink the higher orbit you go. These figures are a best case approximation. But hey, 21 tons is not bad at all. That's about the same as the payload capacity of a Falcon 9. Alright, before we end, I said we'd finish off by discussing some reuse specific things. For a rocket like Starship that returns its booster to the launch pad, 
we're going to want to maximize boost back burn efficiency. Stage separation on the first launch occurred about 95 kilometers downrange from the launch site. For the second one, however, because the thrust was higher, the stage is separated at only 83 kilometers from the launch pad. This means the booster has 12 kilometers less distance to account for during the boost back burn, saving a little propellant. It's not a huge difference, but every little bit helps. Okay, that'll just about do it. I know this is a little different style of video for this channel, but I hope you enjoyed it. With that, I'd like to say thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. Please rate or comment to this video. Once again, thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. And bye!